Welcome to the West End Video Newsletter. My name is Joe LaPiccolo, your host for today's newsletter. Our topic this week is the Central Artery Project and a group called Can Do that was formed about a year ago and that we're working real dil diligently formulating plans in conjunction with the Central Artery, Artery Project. Our uh, guest today is Bob O'Brien, Executive Director of Boston North Alliance. Yeah, uh, Bob is going to tell us more about the uh, Can Do uh, Alliance. And Bob, what what is the Can Do Alliance? The Can Do Joe is an acronym for Central Artery Neighborhood Development Options. The alliance is a consortium of neighborhood groups from the waterfront, the North End, the West End, and Beacon Hill, supported by technical support organizations from the architectural development and planning community. Our purpose is to facilitate neighborhood involvement and participation in the planning for the redevelopment of the land under and around the existing central artery in Boston. Hmm. And uh, when, when did the uh, alliance begin? How long ago? When? The alliance first began in the spring of 1988, and it actually developed from an initiative from the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council. Bill Ferullo, excuse me, Bill Ferullo, who was then the chairperson of the council, and Emily Pugliano, who is the current chairperson, were concerned that the important issues of redevelopment of the artery after it was depressed might get lost amidst other higher visibility issues uh, having to do with construction mitigation. Things, for example, like rodent control and issues of that type which are taking the greatest part of popular public attention. And Emily and Bill wanted to be sure that the community organized itself to deal with the redevelopment issues that would determine the long-term uh, future of the neighborhood surrounding the artery. They came to me in my capacity at that time as executive director of the North End Union, and we began to look at this issue, and it uh, cl sh shortly became clear that it was an issue much larger than the North End itself, and we began to recruit participation from the waterfront, from the West End, and from Beacon Hill as well. And uh, that's basically how the uh, alliance began. And who, who are the current members? What is, what is the group made up of? Uh... The alliance is currently comprised of the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council and the North End Union from the North End, the City Waterfront Association from the Waterfront, the West End Historical Association from the West End, and Hill House from Beacon Hill. Our technical support organizations are Bergmeier Associates, an architectural and planning firm from Boston, and with us today is Louis Mulfelder, one of the principals of Bergmeier Associates. Another technical support organization is the Urban Planning Office of the Archdiocese of Boston, and with us here today is Jerry Pacillo from the Urban Planning Office, and a third participant in the group is the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Of course, important uh, member of the group from the, almost the beginning has been Jimmy Campano, uh, from the West End uh, Historical Association, who probably needs no introduction to this audience. Boy, it is quite a quite a great group you got there. I'm sure you're working hard and come up with some great plans. Uh, where, do, where do you get your funding? Well, after we came together, the Alliance was actually supported for the first couple of years of its operation by a $30,000 grant from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. The priority of the partnership is affordable housing and, of course, a very important part of our planning for neighborhood redevelopment in the area focuses on affordable housing opportunities. Oh, great. And uh, in the past year you've been meeting, what, what has the Alliance uh, been able to formulate so far up, up to date? Can you give us an up-to-date uh, uh, picture of what's going on? Sure. Uh, after an initial period of internal organization, the Alliance wanted to direct public attention to the nature and scope and importance of the development opportunities that were at stake in the Central Artery Project, and also to bring to the attention of the public the fact that the neighborhoods surrounding this project have a very positive and important role to play in the planning for that redevelopment. The vehicle we chose to promote this public perception 
was a public forum that was known as Unbridging the Gap. It uh, featured the results of the Boston Visions competition, which was sponsored by the Boston Society of Architects. And one of the areas of interest of that competition was the Central Artery Corridor. But in addition to those presentations, we also had uh, presentations from city and state planners and a neighborhood panel discussion that involved people from the neighborhood as well as people from the professional and planning communities. The forum was attended by about 300 people from the neighborhoods, from government, and from the professional communities, and was really quite well received. After that, we began to devote our attention to prototype planning for certain of the critical parcels actually in the path of the artery. The first part of that was the architectural component, which will be the focus of our discussion here today, and Lewis will be making that presentation in a moment. Uh, after the architectural planning is complete, we will be looking at the legal, economic, and social aspects of the model, mm -hmm. so that the neighborhood development options we present for consideration and review by the neighborhood are in fact feasible on, from all points of view. And we will be dealing in that larger context with issues of housing, commercial opportunities, open space, and also community facilities. All of this will be input to a community review and discussion process out of which we hope will emerge a community consensus as to the neighborhood development strategies for the artery, which can then be part of the larger planning process. Which brings us, I think, to uh, Lewis's presentation of the work that uh, Bergmeier Associates has done thus far on behalf of the Alliance. And before Lewis begins, I would want to personally extend on behalf of all of our communities uh, a tremendous thanks for the work that he has done in this area, and particularly for the high level of professionalism and sophistication which he and his colleague Michael Davis of Bergmeier Associates have brought to this task. I think you'll find it to be most uh, informative, most revealing, and very provocative from an urban design point of view. Lewis? Thanks, Bob. What I wanted to do first is give you a sense of orientation to the site that we're talking about. I'm going to show you a map of what exists today. And this is the current north end. This is the bay. This is the common. This here is the current west end, which was the former, a former vital residential area. This is the existing Beacon Hill area. And this is the financial district. What we're concerned about now, what we're focusing on, is this section of the central artery, the existing Southeast Expressway. And some of our thoughts, some of our plans, some of the possibilities that, that we want to share with you about what we think can happen to that once the, the elevated highway is taken down and we can begin um, what we think will be knitting the city back together again. There are, there are several plans that have been talked about by both the city and state agencies and we are, are looking at it from the point of view of, of the surrounding neighborhoods. What, one of our beliefs is that the neighborhoods who, who front and share the central artery on a daily basis should be also those same neighborhoods that reap some of the benefits from the central artery. Um, to that extent, let me just orient you to this map. This is the harbor in this area. This is the waterfront park. This is, again, the central artery, which acts like a spine right now, and that we hope to, to infill to bring some of the neighborhoods back together. The north end is at the top of the picture. The west end is over in this direction and Beacon Hill is down at the bottom. This is currently City Hall. One of the, the major moves that we're trying to, um, to bring the attention of, of both the city and the state agencies, because they are ahead of us in this project, because they are currently planning the infrastructure, is that the importance of, of the cross streets, which used to be um, in existence before the artery was built, and what we want to do is, is bring them back so we can try to tie the, the urban fabric back together again. And, and these cross streets, we think, are, are really vital to, the, to the, the sense of neighborhoods and also to the linkage of neighborhoods. We are, 
we're very concerned. Let me talk about linkage for a second. What we're trying to do is, is reconnect some of the areas that have been isolated since the artery was built. One of those areas, quite clearly, is the Blackstone area. The, the Blackstone area shares the same vocabulary, shares the same height, shares the same materials, the brick, um, and sh shares some of the same idiosyncratic, um, the idiosyncratic nature of uh, the sort of medieval structure of the North End. And what we are uh, proposing is that we, we are creating by some of these cross streets and by still the, the same streets that, that used to exist, which are still part of the surface artery, for instance, Blackstone Street. We are, we are trying to create, again, sort of pockets of the North End, in a sense, extending the North End um, down until it meets uh, Congress Street. And by that means, sort of reconnecting the, the North End to the financial district. Um, one of the ways that we, we've done that is by looking at some of the existing street layouts in the North End, for instance, Salem Street, which currently dead ends um, and goes no further than the uh, raised expressway. We're, we're proposing basically a pedestrian link that will link it to what we consider sort of a gateway, of a very important uh, joint um, in the development of the redevelopment of the central artery. And to that extent, we're, we're trying to, to create a focus and, and something that will, will sort of stop this thoroughfare nature of the central artery. And, um, and I'll talk more about this um, in detail when I look at, at this uh, particular uh, neighborhood parcel, which we've, we've designated as a, as a prototypical neighborhood parcel. I also want to mention some of the other possibilities to, to link other areas and other former neighborhoods. One of which, which you're probably very uh, concerned about, is the West End, or what's left of the West End. The, the current West End is in this area. And this is New Chardon Street, this is Merrimack Street. And what we're proposing, or actually what the state is proposing, is that the current Congress Street uh, would continue and, and have a, a stronger connection to Merrimack Street. There would be a divided street and would eventually link um, down to some um, other work at Leverett Circle. We, we're proposing that some of the alignments of New Chardon Street be fattened as they connect to the government center garage, and so they can create um, a usable parcel here. And that usable parcel we would love to see um, developed as, as partly residential, partly retail, and help to establish a residential connection which can feed up to the New, St New Chardon Street development, uh, which is currently at the site of the Hurley um, and the Lindemann buildings. These are the Hill and the Linden buildings here. And there are already um, some proposals that have been put out by the DCPO to develop these sites here. And they're looking for housing, and they're looking for some office space and some retail space. Further down Merrimack Street, there's, there's also talk about um, substantial development in the Lowell Square area. And that's a natural to sort of, by, by making some stepping connections to link all these areas, which also will help link um, through New Sharon Street up to the uh, up to Beacon Hill, and provide some some real valuable connections both for uh, pedestrians, uh, bicycles, um, in, in a friendly animated street sense um, to to the north end and through the north end to the waterfront. The um, there are other areas which have been talked about by both the state and the city. One of which is the, the transportation area, which they're designating here and here. Um, to supplant all the, the buses uh, which are now parking around the base of the Government Center garage. And one of the, one of the potential sites for the, the new MB MBTA bus terminal is this location here. Um, there's still some current talk about some of the off-ramps uh, coming off of the bridge, and so that's eventually going to locate the, uh, the final location for that. Um, but w what we feel strongly about is that there are instances, especially where ramps are coming into the tunnel and out of the tunnel, which are which have been talked about as sort of landscaped oases um, in the middle of all these highways. There's potential there also to to build over with some uh, larger um, institutional buildings or community buildings, that, which could house athletic facilities or natatoriums, um, civic centers, child care centers, elderly centers. There's no lack of, of community. Uh, structures that could be used for, for these special kind of sites. Um, parking is, 
is obviously another major concern that everybody has in, in thinking about new development over the artery. And that becomes probably the most technical um, and complicated issue. We have, we have prepared maps that basically do an inverse topography for this whole area along the artery. And there, are, there really are only two areas that are suitable for parking because of the intricacies of the tunnel boxes and the ramps that go over and under them. And these two areas are highlighted here and also here. And I just want you to keep those in mind because when we talk about our, our, our neighborhood prototype, there are very few places to provide parking, but what we envision is it's a pool of parking in these two areas, not unlike what happens under um, the Commons, the Commons Street Garage, which can provide both uh, parking and uh, for the residences and, and the commercial and the retail space in the area, but also for the businesses. The, um, what I want to do now is, is focus in on this area. And what we have done, we have used um, some, we have tried to delve more deeply into that area to show um, that it's just not a, an abstract idea, that it can really work, that it can really address some of the needs of, of both the North End and of the city in general. So let me show you a plan of this area. This again, this is the parcel that we're focusing in on. And what we've done, if you look down at this, at this plan here, this shows the street level plan. And we, we, what we recognize is that there is a, there's a strong retail element on Salem Street, a strong retail element on Hanover Street, and obviously along Cross Street and in the Blackstone area and in this Parcel 7, which is currently being studied and will be developed, um, you know, along with um, a mercantile and perhaps a, a new area for the pushcart vendors. But what we, what we have found is that there are potentials along this development site for retail to happen at the edges, to happen at the street, which will both animate the street and uh, will provide a, a sort of a, a unity with uh, the fabric around it. At the same time, we want to provide some kind of privatization for the, the residences which, which are living in this block. I mean, it, it's, there's a delicate balance between providing privacy and protection, security for, um, for residential you know, units within a block, within a major urban block, and, and still creating a, a, a very active and dynamic street life. One of the ways we thought we, we could deal with that would be to provide some kind of, of gate, whether it's a symbolic gate, whether it's really a, um, a actual gate that, that can help to uh, monitor those uh, crucial points of entry. The other part, which is probably more likely to happen, is that each of these units would adopt a piece of green space, which they would um, be mandated to maintain and um, to keep up and, uh, and obviously to use, so that it, um, it gives that, that area internally a sense of life. The entrances to all the units, to all the residential units, would be from the inside of the block, and therefore um, that would give them a sense of privacy um, and at the same time allow retail to happen along the edges. The, um, I also wanted to point out that the roofs of these, of these buildings, the roofs in the, in the North End in general, are very intensively used. And we see that, that there's a potential um, with some different cascading roofs, which I'll show you in a second on the elevations, but there's a potential to have an incredible amount of, of diversity in terms of size and in terms of, of, of shape that happen on the roof, some of which could be uh, communalized for the, for the use of the building in, in total and some of which will be uh, for the private use of some of the units. So with that, let me show you, give you a sense of what the, the buildings might look like. And, and purposely, we've been, we've been looking very carefully at the existing structures and the existing fabric in the North End. And you know, what we have found is that what, what animates the North End and, and what anim animates different parts of the city, especially Back Bay, Beacon Hill, um, the South End, are the now the potential for uh, bays and awnings and signatures over windows, around doors, those are the pieces which, uh, which, which help to provide a, a sense of um, a dynamicism to, um, to the units and to the buildings and help to obviously to bring it back to, uh, to a sort of a medieval quality and a, a very livable quality which, which makes Boston 
Um, um, so, um, so livable at the present time, but also um, such, a, such a humane and a, a place where people really want to protect those, those kinds of ideas. Some of the ideas that have developed in, in looking at this and also looking at the, the difference between the street side and the internal side was one of, of height. We're basically working with um, a height limitation of 55 feet, which was been dictated by um, the BRA and some of their zoning um, iPods, which stands for Interim Planning Overlay District. And we thought we should start at that point. Um, what we've done is sort of maintain a 55 foot height at the street, which is a five stories. There would be a story of retail with four stories of uh, units above. And as you get closer toward the inter interior of the, of the court, we, s we begin to step down the units. So that usually you have a combination of three story, four story, and five story um, elevations as you, as you get into the, the courtyard. At the same time, we wanted to have some of the life that's, that's inside of these, these blocks, these neighborhood blocks, to spill out into the street areas where people can sit, where, um, where people on the outside can get glimpses of that there's still some green space within the city. And basically, I mean, there's a, there's a sense of, of a gate so you feel like there's, it's more private. There's, there's still the possibility of, of even creating some parking under a raised um, internal uh, structure on the inside, which, which would become landscaped on the surface, but provide um, some parking underneath. So that is... Um, potentially um, what, what one of these development parcels might become, the, the realities that, that you confront when you start working on something of this scale are, are really immense and they're also very um, exciting. What we found is that we started looking at this site um, on its own and we were sort of drawn to see what the implications of, of the development are for the neighborhoods. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be other uh, people that are um, as interested in the development potential of the artery as, as the neighborhoods. But we decided that we had to start someplace. We had to lend a reality to what it was we were looking at. And um, you know, we understand that there's going to be other parcels being developed here. It's parcel 7. There are you know, incredible complications of stacks um, that are coming out of the tunnel, which, which interfere with some of the building that has to go on. There's an immense amount of information that has to be digested by both the city, the state, and um, you know, all the neighborhood groups in order to make rational decisions. So this basically is, is the first step. Uh, we see this as a, as a development that's going to take 10 to 15 to 20 years, and we plan to be um, involved for, uh, for that whole duration. Thank you, Jerry. You've, you've given us a real insight into the development around the central artery plan. All we've been reading and hearing about is, is mostly the traffic patterns and, and the central artery itself. So you've done a real great job in, in, in giving us an insight into what's going on. Our next guest is uh, Jerry Fusillo from the Urban Planning Office. Jerry, can you give us, tell us about what you're doing? Essentially, we were asked to, to help the Alliance in thinking through some of the technical development issues around uh, developing these prototype sites. Uh, the planning office has been involved in housing development and community development issues now for 20 years, both in and around the metropolitan area. And the idea here is, uh, as an agency uh, of the Archdiocese of Boston, we have a very big concern over a neighborhood involvement in these types of decision-making processes and see a role here uh, to be able to bring together the neighborhood groups that are affected rather than simply having one neighborhood uh, express a concern and another neighborhood express a concern. The hope is that all of the neighborhoods around the uh, artery sites can get together and come to some consensus over what are the most effective means and what are the best things to do for uh, the redevelopment of those sites. We will be looking at uh, not only the community development issues around that, but we'll also be looking at some of the more creative ways in which housing development can take place, the economic modeling of these uh, prototype sites, what will make housing affordable 15 or 20 years from now is certainly an open question, but what we will be doing is using whatever 
experience we've had to date looking at some of the economics, maybe looking at some cooperative housing, maybe looking at the affordability factors long term, and trying to create avenues and opportunities for those people who've lived along the artery in those neighborhood, neighborhoods to both share ideas and resources, to be better connected physically along the artery and the new artery, and also to have opportunity for housing in whatever commercial space is, is generated around the artery. Great, Jerry. That's, those are all important issues that we, we want to hear more about later on, and I'm sure you'll be looking and watching what's going on and bring, updating us on this. Bob, uh, getting back to you, Bob, uh, this, is, this is 10 years away, what's coming up. Uh, can you tell us why we're hearing about this now, even though it's 10 years away? Well, there are probably three reasons why it's important for the neighborhoods to become involved in this process now. One is a technical one. That has to do with the fact that the designers and engineers that are working on the tunnel itself need to know in the next 12 to 18 months what will be expected to be built on top of the tunnel so that they can engineer the tunnel box to accommodate it. It's very important for the neighborhood as well as the public planners to be involved in suggesting what kind of development we want 10 years from now because it's in the next 12 to 18 months that that has to be built in to the subsurface structure. The second reason I think is perhaps described as psychological in a way. Uh, from the point of view of the surrounding neighborhoods, I think it's fair to say that the real potential benefit of the depression of the artery is its development potential, its neighborhood redevelopment and restoration potential. Other than that, the artery project, particularly during the construction phase, is going to involve a tremendous amount of costs for the neighborhood. If the neighborhood is to endure those costs through a very long and disruptive period of uh, uh, construction, they've also got to be able to sense, appreciate, and plan for the benefits that will come at the end of that tunnel. No pun intended. And Therefore, for psychological reasons, it's important to have a sense of the benefits as well as the costs of this process. Um, thirdly, I think there is a kind of political and planning reason for the neighborhoods to become involved. Planning for this type of development, even though it's 10 or 20 years from now, as Lewis has suggested, is in fact a very long-term process. And when the community is involved, it is a very complicated process. And if the benefits of redevelopment are going to accrue to the neighborhoods, it's important for the neighborhoods to play during the course of that planning process, at the beginning and middle and at the end, a very active and a very proactive role. In this process, there will be no time to catch up 10 years from now if we don't keep up with the process as we go. So those are the reasons why something that's going to happen 10 years needs to be focused upon today. And and that's why we're doing it, even as others are paying attention to other aspects of the project, which are also important, uh, but which do not focus on the longer term. Okay, those are some real good, valid reasons. Uh, where, does, where does the Alliance go from here? Actually, I probably There's should turn this over to Jerry, because Jerry has been taking a very uh, much more active role in formalizing the Alliance in ways that uh, I think are an important next phase for where, where we're moving. Essentially, the Alliance has been a loosely knit group of people uh, up to this point, neighborhood people, people interested in what's happening. Over the next few months, we will be actually going out and getting community representatives from every neighborhood in an elected format so that we will have uh, representation from all the neighborhoods. We intend to uh, make the uh, Kendo Alliance actually an incorporated body and begin to look for funding sources outside of what we have typically had to date so that we can be as up to date and, and uh, up to speed as any group looking at the artery issues. In that end, we will also be looking to hire some consultants and people who can keep up with the day-to-day -day workings of the artery as it faces the city. Thank you. That's great. Uh, we hope we've given you some insight into the Central Artery Project and uh, Thank you. I want to thank our guests for being here today and see you at the next West End Video Newsletter. Thank you.